We're going to do now what we do each Sunday. We're going to look at a passage from God's Word. We'll talk about what it means, why it matters, and what we should do about it. So if you have a Bible with you, Bible app, whatever it is, if you would turn today to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9, beginning at verse 1, and when you found it, if you're able, if you would stand together with me for the reading of God's Word, I'll read through this together for us. Matthew writes this. And getting into a boat, he, this is Jesus, crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But knowing Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let me pray for us quickly, and then we'll dive into this. Spirit of God, would you illumine the preaching of your word? Now shine brightly through this uh, into every place of darkness. Open up eyes and ears and hearts and minds today, and accomplish whatever it is you want to accomplish through this word. Uh, I'm asking you to do incredible things above and beyond what I even know how to ask for. And as I always ask now, eternal God, would you move and govern my tongue to speak your truth? Amen. Well, raising two incredible daughters, uh, particularly early on, gave me both the opportunity and the privilege of seeing all kinds of different TV shows which I never would have otherwise probably watched as an adult. So it's just how it works out sometimes. And, and it, honestly, I mean that. It really was an opportunity and a privilege to, to learn because many times, I mean, they're presenting the lesson in a simplistic way, but I mean, the things they're presenting, the truths they're talking about, quite profound quite often. And, and who knows? I know God's got a sense of humor, and so I'm sure part of his plan was also to be like, hey, yo, West, you, you listen to, there's clearly some things you haven't learned yet here either. So fair enough. Good, good point. Of all the shows, though, that we watched, uh, you know, sitting there in the morning with our cups of milk and whatever, was the ones that I loved the best was this one called El Elmo's World. Did anyone ever watch this show growing up? Elmo's World, which is kind of a spinoff from Sesame Street. Thank you for that hand. I see that hand. Um, it's kind of a spinoff of, of Sesame Street, right? And it had, it was great because it had a catchy intro song. Um, it was actually intellectually stimulating, like it wasn't just random stuff and noise and colors, like it was actually teaching things, fun characters. And then, of all the characters, one of the characters from that show, which I liked the best, was Mr. Noodle. To be technical, Mr. M Noodle's brother, Mr. Noodle, I don't know how that worked, uh, played by the incredibly talented Michael Jeter, uh, who was, he was basically a, a clown that didn't speak, like not a mime, but like a clown that didn't talk, he just acted things out. And so how this would go is Elmo would ask Mr. Noodle a question. Mr. Noodle, how do you wash your hands? And then, much to the children's delight, Mr. Noodle would completely miss the point. He would totally miss like what was supposed to be going on, and he would act out what he thought was the answer to the question in all kinds of silly ways. So how do you wash your hands, Mr. Noodle? And he'd like put his feet in the sink or put soap in his mouth, and the kids would call out, no, Mr. Noodle, not your feet, your hands. It was great. It was funny. Um, and, and the kids learn things in the process, how to wash their hands, brush their teeth, all, all, all kinds of things like this. But I bring it up because, I don't, I don't know if it's the same for you, but as I read this passage from Matthew's Gospel that we're looking at here this morning, I got to admit, when you look at Jesus' initial response to what seems like an obvious request for healing, he seems to miss the point exactly like Mr. Noodle would when he was asked a question. He doesn't seem to see what's just like obviously in front of him. If, if this passage was like happening on Elmo's world, you could hear the kids calling out, no, Jesus, he doesn't need forgiveness. He needs healing or whatever. Which is one thing when we're reading 
passage in the Bible, we're reading a story about something that happened to someone else 2,000 years ago, and we're like, wow, that's strange. I wonder what that was about. It's an entirely different thing when you're the one with the question. When you're the one bringing your desperate need to Jesus, and he's responding in what feels like an equally incomprehensible way. Just like, what are you doing? I mean, just to give you a few examples of this, I mean, it was just a few years ago. I remember we were specifically praying for the Bowles family. Uh, Glenn and Sharon, and Glenn was dealing with some really serious health issues. He had some important surgeries he was getting, uh, and it was really awful. So we're gathering as a church, we're praying for them. And then in what felt like a month, they were evicted from their apartment, and Sharon got cancer. And we're like, did, did you hear what we were praying? Or, or I've shared this story before. My, uh, early on in my marriage, my wife and I, we're, uh, we're, I'm praying for our family. God, help us. Help us. Uh, we're, we're struggling financially. We're barely making ends meet. Our marriage is hanging by a thread. Help us, God. And in the midst of a day, I lost my job. And we found out Sarah was pregnant with our second child. And in all of these things, it's, it's the same way. Like We're like, do you not see what's going on? We're like, no, Jesus. But it's actually, it's more like, I think there's, there's more anger in it, probably just like, no, Jesus. That's, that's not at all what they needed right now. This isn't what I've been asking you for. Can't you see what's obviously my need is? And it's not funny. And no one's laughing. But then I say all that, and I don't know. You, you keep reading, and then suddenly it starts to seem like, well, no, maybe there was something more going on than what I could see initially, because as you see there in verse 6, Jesus then does go on and heal the paralyzed man. He, he does do what we think would be the most obvious thing. And then years later, Bowles, they, they have a place to live. Sharon's been healed of cancer twice. And I'm employed, got two amazing daughters, and I'm still married. And, and so, which means, I guess, like as it relates to the passage, first of all, it means maybe Jesus' seemingly incomprehensible offer of forgiveness to a paralyzed man wasn't as misguided as it seemed. And if that's true, then maybe Jesus' seemingly incomprehensible answers to your prayers and to mine aren't either. And so that's just what I want to talk about for a minute. I want to just explore this together with you for just a moment as we dig into this passage together because here's what I see when I look at this whole passage. Much more than missing the point, I believe Jesus is making the point that forgiveness, a reconciled relationship with God, is actually our greatest need. That is our most pressing, important need of all and that his kingdom is a kingdom where both our greatest need as well as every other need we bring can be fully met in him. He is present and powerful to deal with both. So let's, let's look at this together and, and see if we can figure it out for ourselves. If you closed your Bible, your Bible app, would you open again with me to our passage there, Matthew chapter 9, beginning of verse 1. Follow along with me. As we look at just two things today, we're going to talk about our need of forgiveness and then Jesus' authority to forgive. Our need of forgiveness and Jesus' authority to forgive. So let's look first of all at our need of forgiveness. If you look at verse 1, you'll see here this is Jesus honoring the request of the Gadarean pig herders that we looked at last week to, to leave their region. He's like, all right, he gets into his boat sails back to his hometown, which was Capernaum in Galilee. This is the kind of home base for Jesus' ministry. But if you look at verse 2 now, we see this is where Matthew kind of sets the scene for the, the whole, uh, what's going to take place next. He writes this, And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. So what this means is uh, these friends are bringing their buddy to, to Jesus to be healed. And, and rather than just kind of like, I don't know, fireman carrying him or piggybacking him, whatever, they literally pick up the whole bed that he's lying on and just plunk the whole thing right down in front of Jesus. And Matthew doesn't list these additional details in his gospel, but in the parallel accounts of this passage that we have in both Mark and Luke's gospel, 
This uh, is where we learn that this is the scene, like if you grew up in church or went to Sunday school, you might be familiar with this. This is the scene where these guys can't get in to see Jesus. Uh, he's, he's too packed in there, and so they actually go up on the roof of the house where he's teaching, tear the roof off, and lower the guy down right in front of him. It's a, it's a funny, pretty incredible scene, actually. And, and I bring it up, um, even though Matthew doesn't, because I think it helps make more sense of what Matthew goes on to say when he talks about Jesus seeing their faith. He says there, Jesus seeing that when he saw their faith, because unless this is like that movie Free Guy and Jesus has special glasses where he can see like a faith meter on someone, and he's looking, he's like, I can see your faith is strong. Unless that's going on, really what Matthew is actually trying to describe is, is Jesus sees this amazing demonstration of faith. That these guys would literally tear off a roof in order to get him in front of Jesus. I liked uh, F.D. Bruner's comment on, on the fuller details that Mark and Luke give us, noting that when, when we see them like make, going to these incredible lengths to get this man in front of Jesus, it shows us, he says, that faith is bold. Faith is importunate. Faith is insistent and sometimes indifferent to social consequences. De-roofing is antisocial. And he goes on to say this, I love this. Faith lives under one great compulsion, to get into the presence of Jesus. I love that. And now there's an interesting pattern developing, which started all the way back in chapter 8, if you've been with us over the last few weeks. As Jesus heals a leper, a centurion servant, Peter's mother-in-law, and now these demon-possessed men, because just as with each of those miracles, what we see is that these men don't ask Jesus directly for healing. All they do is present their need to Jesus, and then Jesus responds to their faith by healing this man. But if you look at this last part of verse 2 now, this is where we come to this really strange, incomprehensible response that I was talking about earlier, where Jesus responds to their faith, and I believe this is the faith of both the friends as well as the paralytic, by saying, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. To which I imagine every single one of them just thinking, so, sorry? Take heart, my son. What did he say? Your sins are forgiven? And, and, and I don't know, maybe every single one of them like putting on their very best present face uh, in, 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 the, in the midst of this present face is that face you make when someone gives you a gift that you don't know what it is or you hate it, but you're trying to still look thankful and you're like, oh, wow, thank you. This is something. Um, but regardless, I, they, they've, there's got to be some disappointment in, in Jesus' response to, to all this effort they've gone to. They brought the man in front of Jesus and have him respond this way. And no, not because having your sins forgiven isn't, isn't amazing, but it's because it's clearly not what this man needs. That's not what he needs most. Jesus seems to completely miss the point, just like Mr. Noodle and Elmo's were. We're just like, come on, Jesus, can't, don't you see what's most obvious, what the, the most obvious need that this man has? And my guess is if you follow Jesus for any length of time yourself, you have felt that exact same way and asked that exact same question in light of Jesus' seemingly incomprehensible responses to some of your own prayers. But the point the point that Jesus is making both to this group of friends and I believe to you and I today as well, by responding this way is, yes. Yes, actually, it is obvious to me what's most important here. In fact, it's the whole reason I came. We're going to dig more into that in just a second, but before we do, I think it's important that we pause here for just a second and consider what Jesus is not saying. We need to look at this, actually, because if we don't, I think we're just going to check out on Jesus. We'll, we'll log off on him before we get to the good stuff that he actually is saying. So just very quickly, if you look again at the end of verse 2, what you notice is that Jesus, what he does not say to the paralytic and his friends is, your paralysis, that doesn't matter. That kind of stuff isn't important to me. I don't know why you guys are going to all these lengths, tearing off the roof of these nice people's house, making all this mess to get this guy in front of me. What you need to understand is that, is that what truly matters in life is the spiritual. That's what matters most. Stop worrying about all these temporal, physical needs. That stuff doesn't matter to me. 
You notice that? I mean, he doesn't say that anywhere in this passage. But, yes, while not denying the great importance of this man's physical need at all, just not, not, like not for a moment, what Jesus does say and what he implies in his response is this. Yes, it is obvious to me what's most important here. And as important as your physical need is to me, your greatest need is actually not your broken spinal cord. Your greatest need is actually your broken relationship with your creator. That's your most important pressing need. And the reason they couldn't understand that and the reason we often misunderstand it is because we're so zoomed in on the problem because it's right up in our face, right? That need, that, that concern, that crisis, it's right up here and that's all we can see. But when we zoom out and we see the bigger picture, it starts to help us get more perspective and see it properly to see where the order of things is supposed to go. Because when we zoom out on the message of the Bible, the big picture of the Bible is that although God made the world and everything in it good and perfect, mankind rebelled against God. We, we sought to be our own gods. And as a result, although we were made for relationship with God, that relationship was now broken, became severed, and sin's curse infected everything, bringing sickness, death, violence, paralysis, Every kind of evil thing that we see in this world today. But God's promise was that one day he would send a rescuer who would deal with that sin problem. Who would rescue us from sin's curse and and bring us back into relationship with God himself. And, And what the message of the Bible is, is that Jesus is that rescuer. Rescue is first and foremost why Jesus came. That's what we learned right from the beginning of Matthew's gospel, when Jesus is first born and and Jesus' adoptive father, Joseph, is told, you shall call his name Jesus, the Hebrew name Yeshua, which means God saves, because he will save his people from their sins. That's why this child is coming. That's why Jesus came to earth to live and to die and to be resurrected, not to host a traveling miracle man show for three years. It was to deal with the curse of sin that none of us could break on our own, but that continued to keep us separated from a relationship with God. That was the purpose of his coming. That's why I love the way one commentator put this. In describing Jesus' seemingly incomprehensible response to this man's obvious desire for healing, saying that what Jesus is basically saying by healing this man's broken relationship with God first Before he heals his broken spinal cord, because remember, Jesus is going to heal his physical need in just a second. What Jesus is saying by that is, my son, if all I did was just heal your physical need, but left your spiritual need untouched, I'd be playing a terrible trick on you. What trick? Why? Why? Because for the rest of that man's life, whatever 40, 50 years he had left, if Jesus had just healed his paralysis, He'd feel whole. He'd feel complete. He'd feel like now he had everything that he needed when he didn't. The problem for that paralytic as well as for you and I today is that we we lose sight of that big picture. We have everything so close and we think this is our most pressing need. We, We think what we need to be saved from most is that thing right up in our face. We need to be saved from that. That's the most important thing. I need to be saved from this sickness. I need to be saved from my depression. I need to be saved from my loneliness, being unpopular, being rejected. We, we say things like, like we heard in this video, like if I just had that, if only I had blank, I'd be complete. I'd have everything I ever needed. And so then, then insert what, what miracle man Jesus becomes is nothing more than a means to whatever we see as our true Savior. Jesus, get me that relationship, get me that healing, get me that career, get me that blue check mark by my name. Help me get that, Jesus, so that I can be whole and complete. But you see, that's why it's so important to keep reading, to to see it seems incomprehensible, the order, but the order is actually teaching us something because Jesus does go on to heal the man's physical need. Because, yeah, sure, if, if you do attain whatever salvation you think will make you whole and complete, yeah, absolutely, you might indeed feel whole and complete for whatever years you have left on this earth. But as Tim Keller says so well, 
outside of a restored relationship with God through Jesus, the popular and the celebrities of this world are on their way to being eternally forgotten. The rich and the powerful of this world are on their way to being eternally poor and eternally weak. Which is why the call of Jesus, back in Matthew 6, if you were here when we looked at that, is still remains so valuable for all who will hear and heed it when Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God. Uh, uh, surrender the, the rule over your tiny kingdom of self and make me the Lord of your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what Jesus is offering here. Righteousness, which means right standing with God. A not guilty uh, claim, a not guilty sentence before a holy God. That's the reason Jesus came to make that possible. Seek those things first. Make that the first priority. And all these other things, all these other good things that you value so much will be added unto you as well. The order matters. Which means ultimately the question each and every one of us needs to ask in light of what we've already seen here already is, what do you want most? What do you want most? Do you want the illusion of wholeness? The illusion of being complete for whatever years I have left? Or do I want the reality of that? both now as well as for all eternity. Because the reality of that is only found in Jesus. And it only works in this order. Okay, so that's our need of forgiveness. Again, not, not for a moment to suggest that any other need that we bring to Jesus isn't important or we shouldn't care about that. Only that forgiveness, a restored relationship with God, is our greatest need. Last thing I want to look at with you from our passage now is Jesus' authority to forgive. Jesus' authority to forgive. And we need to look at this because it's all well and good for Jesus or anybody for that matter to say, hey, forgiveness, that's your most important need. I'm the one who can give it to you. It's another thing entirely to be able to carry it out. And when you look at verse 3 of our passage now, the scribes there, the teachers of the law, who are for the most part, these guys are like samurai masters of missing the point, they pick up on this important question when they hear Jesus' response to the paralytic lowered through the roof in front of him. And they say to themselves, this man is blaspheming. Which blaspheming, if you don't know what that is, that basically just means to dishonor God in some way, either through taking his name in vain or, or claiming to be able to do something that only he can do. That's what they're, they're pointing out. And actually in Mark and Luke's parallel account of this same passage, they go on to ask the question, who can forgive sins but God alone? And I say they're missing the point, actually, because you notice they don't even seem to have a problem with the fact that Jesus didn't heal. They're just concerned about the theology. Jesus, your theology is wrong. And isn't that the way that so often we as religious people can miss the point ourselves? We get the theology right and we miss the, the human component, that we're talking about a person. But to be fair, they, they come to the conclusion honestly. For all through the Old Testament scriptures, this is what we see. God says again and again, I alone am the one who can forgive sins. I, I am the one who blots out transgressions. Um, uh, Bruner, again, notes this. In, in defense of the scribe's offense at Jesus' claim to be able to forgive sins, he says, people cannot just go around telling other people that God holds nothing against them. Claiming to know and deliver divine amnesty comes close to presumption, yet Jesus authoritatively tells another human being how he stands with God. What? But in fact, that's exactly what Jesus is doing. <laughs> and that's exactly what he's claiming about himself. He's like, yeah, you, you're seeing it right. In pronouncing sin over this paralytic, forgiveness of sin over this paralytic, that is what Jesus is claiming. If you notice the tense, the tense in the Greek, we can't see it here, but he's saying your sins are forgiven now, right in this moment. Not one day your sins will be forgiven. And he is absolutely claiming that he is the one who is bringing about that forgiveness. Davies and Allison note, Jesus has not acted as a channel of forgiveness, but as its source. Look at verse 4 with me now. It's where we read Jesus, but Jesus knowing their thoughts, which, wow, that's got to strike awe and fear into anyone's heart. I, I can't imagine walking out of church or class or, or work someday and having someone run up to me and be like, why were you thinking that an hour ago? That's awful. I'd be like, what? Excuse me? Like, that's a terrifying thought in itself. 
But, but Jesus, as the God-man, he has this ability to, to see these thoughts of these scribes. And so literally, he essentially asks them that same question. It's like, why, why were you just thinking that? But note, and this is incredibly important to see, Jesus doesn't ask them why they were thinking that no one but God could forgive sin. Nowhere does Jesus correct that assumption. He's like, no, no, you're right. No one can. What he questions is why they accuse him of blaspheming for saying that he could. And that's the point. The divine implication Jesus was making was clear because he wanted it to be clear. Yes, no one can forgive sins but God alone. And yes, as God, I am pronouncing the pardon of God over this man's sin. And they understood him correctly. They knew what he was claiming. But as we read on, this is where Jesus backs up his divine claim with a divine proof. Asking, as we see in verse 5 there, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise and walk? Which is that's a perfect question to ask. Likely the question on everyone's mind. Yeah, it's, it's easy. All well and good to say to someone, hey, your sins are forgiven by God, but how, how can I prove that? How can I show you that your sins are forgiven? And so the answer, standing in front of this paralytic, still lying on a mat in front of him, is obvious. The easier thing to say is your sins are forgiven. Because how am I going to know? And with the answer to his question clearly understood, Jesus goes on to declare, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Literally, that's spelling out the purpose of Jesus' miracles, that the miracles themselves aren't the point. The miracles point to who he is. He turns to this paralytic and says, rise, pick up your mat, and go home. And he rose and went home. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> Everyone is awestruck and amazed at what Jesus did as he essentially validates his claim to have divine authority to forgive sins by performing what, to them anyways, was the harder of two tasks. To tell a paralytic to get up, pick up your mat, and go home, and to have them actually do it. He does that too. But it's interesting because once again, just as we saw two weeks ago in our message about the cost of discipleship, Matthew doesn't list what the scribe's response or reaction to Jesus' call is. And I think this is a call. This is a call to discipleship, a call to following Jesus as much as anywhere else in the Gospels. Jesus is saying, I have authority on earth to fix what's broken between you and God. Will you come and receive that gift? For what Jesus has clearly taught here is both, first of all, forgiveness for sin. A restored relationship with God is your greatest need. And secondly, I have divine authority to offer it to you. Will you accept that? Will you accept the forgiveness I've come to bring? Which, if you think about that, that's, that's great news to someone who understands that they've sinned and knows that they aren't able in themselves to earn God's acceptance. That's great news. But it's not great news to someone who thinks that they've already earned it. If you feel like, I don't, I don't need Jesus to do this for me. I, I've, I've obeyed the rules. I've done this well enough. God does accept me. Or if you feel like you don't have sin to be forgiven from to begin with. This doesn't sound like good news. Like what, That sounds like nonsense. I don't, I don't need to be forgiven. But again, Matthew doesn't tell us how the scribes respond. And in so doing, I think he invites you and me to consider how we will respond how we will respond to Jesus' call to follow him. The order of Jesus' miracle revealing forgiveness for sin is our greatest need, and then the divine power of Jesus' miracle revealing his divine authority to forgive. And so the call of this passage then is, what about you? How will you respond? Will you accept both your need to be forgiven as well as Jesus' free offer to grant it to you today? Or... Will you continue to seek to be your own savior? Or seek Jesus as only a means to getting whatever it is you think will truly save you? Everything. Everything as it relates to your wholeness and your completeness, both now and for all eternity, depends on how you answer that question. In his own work on this passage, Tim Kelly makes a fascinating observation about that question that Jesus asked in verse 5. If you look back with me there for just a minute, we'll, we'll close with this. Remember, Jesus asked the question, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? 
and Keller notes this, after countless pages written on this, we still have a good question before us. Which one is easier? It's not, or it's hard to say. On the first reading, Jesus seems to be saying, anybody can say your sins are forgiven, but not everybody can heal. To show you, therefore, that I am the Lord with authority to forgive sins, I say pick up your mat and walk. And the imperative implication is that it's a lot harder to heal somebody than to forgive somebody. And he is signaling his power to do the latter by performing the former. The former. Great. He goes on. But this is such a profoundly puzzling question because it has more than one answer. Jesus is also saying, my friends, it is going to be infinitely harder to affect the forgiveness of sins than you can imagine. I'm not just a miracle worker. I am a Savior. Any miracle worker can say, take up your mat and walk. But only the Savior of the world can say to a human being, all your sins are forgiven. You see it? Like From our perspective, the perspective of this paralytic and this crowd, Pick up your mat and walk is is way harder to say than your sins are forgiven. And healing is, is that man's greatest need. We say that's what's most important. But for Jesus, healing this man who is paralyzed is nothing in comparison to what it will cost him in order to be his savior. Despised, rejected, stripped, naked and humiliated, exposed, suffering, slandered forsaken and then killed, but wounded not for his own transgressions, but for yours, crushed not for his own iniquities, but for mine. Do you see it now? Jesus bore all those things that we're so fearful of, all those things that we look to countless other saviors to deliver us from at infinite cost to himself, all so that he might be both the one who can truly give us completeness and wholeness in him, as well as to have our greatest need, forgiveness for sin and a restored relationship with the God for whom we were designed to be in relationship with. We could have all those needs met fully and completely in him. Which means truly, no matter how incomprehensible Jesus' answers to our questions and our prayers on behalf of others may seem to us at times, I think what we're seeing here today is that Jesus' kingdom is truly a kingdom where our greatest need and every other need we bring can be, full, can be fully met in him. He has power and authority to do both. Man, as I see that, it, it makes me feel, as the hymn writer Augustus Toplady said so well, in light of this unfathomable grace freely offered to all who will simply come and humbly receive, love so amazing so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. It's worth everything to have this, and everything is what's offered. Amen. We're going to come to the Lord's Supper in a moment, but I want us to take a moment to just pause and sit in this for a second. Jesus has brought this offer of forgiveness. Maybe maybe you're here right now this morning, and maybe for a lot of you, forgiveness is something you received from Jesus a long time ago. But today it feels like it was a long time ago, and life and struggle and failure has happened, and you feel like maybe you've lost it, or you've out-sinned Jesus, and that offer isn't still there. The call from today is rest in the forgiveness that Jesus has offered for all time. It's yours still today. Maybe you understand that you've been forgiven, but you withhold that forgiveness from others. You don't see that forgiven people are to be those who forgive. And the call of this passage today is to call you to forgive, to offer that forgiveness that you've freely received to others. Or maybe you're here today or you're watching online and you have never received Jesus' forgiveness. You've never known that that was your greatest need. And to have this offered today feels unfathomable, but I hope today you would hear this call and receive Jesus' offer of forgiveness for yourself. It's very simple. 
It simply comes with an acknowledgement before God to just say, God, I understand that I'm, I have sinned. And I believe that you sent Jesus to deal with that problem for me, to die for me. And so I receive your forgiveness today. Make me your child. Help me to follow you the best I can the rest of my days. And, and the scriptures are clear. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That forgiveness is yours today. And if that's something, if that's a choice you made, man, I would love to know about that. Uh, whether you're here or online, um, I'd love to know that you received that forgiveness from Jesus today. Please reach out uh, and let me know.